as we've just heard from the chancellor, uh, Schultz, he does not expect, in fact, he's quite confident there will not be a recession in Germany this year. Do you have that same confidence? Well, thanks for having me. You know, I, I, I do agree with them. I thought that the risk to Germany was really the energy situation going into the winter to the extent that we had a very cold winter and they had to start rationing uh, energy and they had to cut back industrial Germany to keep people warm. I felt that that was a really tough situation potentially. We're, we're now deep enough into the winter and we sort of know where we are. We know what's in reserve and storage. I think Germany is going to get through the winter very, fairly easily with energy. And I think they're going to continue to power through this. So I, I, I'm in agreement with the chancellor. Biggest economy in Europe. What does that say about Europe in general? I think, no only recession in Europe? Well, I think Europe is going to muddle through this. The UK, not as clear. But it's, it, it's, it's not going to be easy. You know, we've still got pretty, pretty high inflation in Europe. It's, it's, it's a difficult situation. You know, in the United States, when we raise interest rates, it, we can all handle it. The, the interest rate picture in Europe that uh, Lagarde has to deal with is a, is a little bit different. You know, Ger Germany can handle higher interest rates as you start raising interest rates. Southern Europe has a lot more difficulty with the reality of what's going on. You were director of the National Economic Council, so you followed the U.S. economy pretty closely. What about the United States? What are the chances of recession? I talked earlier today with Jane Fraser of City. She thinks second half, it's quite possible. You know, it's interesting. We've been around Davos and everyone here is negative. So the, first of all, that, that tells me we should be positive. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, 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 you know, I was at a dinner last night with a, a lot, a lot of CEOs, global CEOs, and you know, most of them raised their hand that they were pretty negative about the economy. Then when they talked about their business, they were all pretty positive about their business. So I think everyone thinks everyone else has a problem. My, my opinion is I'm pretty optimistic. That doesn't mean we're having a bullish economy. What I'm optimistic about is I think we can muddle through where we are. I think the Fed's getting to the end of their tightening cycle. We may have a couple more 25 basis point increases from the Fed. We top out around 5% in Fed funds here. But I think we've all factored that, factored that into the situation. And I, I feel like we're in a relatively good situation. The consumer is okay. They're not great. We're starting to see a few cracks. Um, the economy is slowing down, but I think we're going to muddle through. You think the Biden administration is getting it about right now in economic policy? In the past, you've been critical of some of the f fiscal stimulus. I you have. thought it was too much. No, I, 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 I was critical. I thought that the uh, first big, you know, $1.9 trillion stimulus package, it was unnecessary. You know, the economy was turning. We were putting people back to work. There was enormous demand for labor. We had come out of this goods economy, and we turned back to our normal comfort zone, which is a service economy, and people in the service industry couldn't hire and we were still giving out stimulus. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. Gary, you've gone from a, being a financial executive, being a tech executive now, you're vice chair of IBM. Uh, give us a little insight into where tech is heading, particularly in computing. We hear a lot about quantum computing, we hear about uh, open AI and chat GPT. Where are we going in terms of artificial intelligence? So look, the, the whole machine learning, artificial intelligence, industry, it, it's really interesting because it affects industries at sort of almost all ends of the spectrum. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're out hiring people, and we've all lived through a labor shortage, as, as I was talking about, we've been unable to hire people, we've got record low unemployment in the United States. So, you know, AI and machine learning has been used to fill that void. So it, it, in the bottom end of the spectrum, where, where it's been almost impossible to hire people, we see companies using machine learning to replace people that they can't hire. So a typical example of that is you pull up to a McDonald's drive-in today, you're probably ordering from a machine. It's not a human being. You're ordering your Big Mac and your French fries and your milkshake from a machine. Not because the McDonald's wants a machine, it's because they can't hire people to do it. And it's very efficient to go to the machine. You take the other end of the spectrum, we're using machine learning or using automation to really enhance the skills of people higher up in the spectrum. So you take someone that runs your cybersecurity business, they've now got machine learning sitting right next to them, they've got artificial intelligence, and they become much more effective at running the whole cybersecurity operation of your organization by having that analytic tool next to them. Uh, and a related topic, and IBM has now come up with some policies on this, what about the environment? So environment, ESG's been very, very big, climate's a very big issue. How can tech help us? So environment's really important. And, and as a technology company, we think about how we can help our clients. And we look, at the, we look at climate no different than any other sort of business operation. First of all, it's a data problem. It's a big data problem. So you have to collect the data and you have to get it into a usable format. That's something that IBM really thrives on is we help people collect data, we help getting it into a usable format. Once you have the, the data, you need the technology, you need the software, you need the analytic tools to start evaluating the data. So you've now got a baseline, you're evaluating your data. You know how much carbon you're admitting. 
Now, once you know how much carbon you're emitting, you can go through policies and procedures to change the way you're running your business, how you're running your business, and you can measure success. So you operationalize it, and you become much more efficient at running your business once you have the technology and once you have the data in a, in a way that's useful to you as a company. So is IBM working specifically in the climate area and ways to use data in the way you just described? We're working in all areas on data. Data is really important to us. Machine learning is really important to us. But the, the, the environmental area is one area where our clients are starting to spend more more and more time mm. because they're going to have, look, they're going to have regulatory requirements. They're going to have reporting to allow their regulatory agencies and they're under invested in this area. So it's an area with a lot of opportunity. You were a leader of Goldman Sachs for many years and you're not there anymore as far as I can tell. At the same time, there's a lot of talk about layoffs or at least cutbacks in workforce in, on, on Wall Street in general. What do you make of that from a distance? I understand you're not there, but is this out of the ordinary? You know, Dave, we, we're seeing it across, the, across many industries. We've seen it in the technology industry. We've seen it in many different industries. It's typically part of the business cycle. You know, that people get laid, you know, pe people tend to get laid off as the economy contracts. We saw a lot of businesses expand over the last year and a half as we came out of COVID. People were really understaffed. Yeah. And people grew their businesses accordingly as, as the economy was growing. And people are just always trying to right size. At the same time, a lot of people who are losing their jobs right now are finding ones right away because there's a shortage, as you said, there's a shortage of unskilled, certainly a huge shortage of unskilled, but even in skilled positions. Why don't we just let more people into the country? You know, that, that, that's a great question. You know, we, we've got people coming in the country. We've got people coming in the country illegally. The question to me is even, even more basic than that. Why aren't we giving them the ability to work? Fascinating. And, and what about productivity? Because if you're going to grow the economy, as I understand yeah. it, economists say, you got to have more people and or more productivity. Yeah. Can you drive productivity? Look, I think we can drive productivity. You know, we, we, we at IBM talk about this. You know, the, the, the new age of computing is going to be quantum computing. Quantum computing is going to be very important. It's going to be very important to the environment. We're working on things in quantum that can help the environment. It's going to be something that we think can drive productivity as we can solve bigger and bigger equations and we can solve bigger problems. But it's all about productivity. You're right. It's not just putting people to work. It's making people more productive, getting more work out of the same people. You've been in the private sector, obviously, in very senior positions. You've been in the public sector, very senior positions. As you look out in 2023 and beyond, maybe as important, what do you think the biggest challenges are? You know, look, we, we've got to figure out where we are economically. You know, we, we've gone through this sort of unprecedented period. We went through a zero interest rate policy, which I don't think made sense at the time. We went through a huge amount of quantitative easing. We're now going through a sort of unprecedented interest rate tightening cycle. We're going through quantitative tightening. We've got to see where things naturally settle into a more normalized economic picture. And I think we will get there. You know, I don't think the Fed should be using their balance sheet as, as aggressive as, as they have been. We, I'd like to see the Fed get out of the balance sheet business. I'd like to see all the central banks get out of the balance sheet business. And we're going to have to understand what the normal growth trajectories look like. You know, we, we've been through unprecedented economic cycles at both ends of the spectrum, literally in the last, you know, five, six years here.